Hey, Jeff, uh, thanks for coming on and uh, taking the time to t talk with me today about Settlers. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me here. Um, you were the first to talk about it. Yeah, I know. Well, you were the first person that pops into my head and I'm like, nope, I have to get Jeff. Jeff's the only person to talk to you about this. Um, so if you don't know what we're talking about, uh, we are talking about the book Settlers, Mythology of the White Proletariat by Jay Sakai, uh, which was published for the first time in the early 80s. And uh, I want to just start there. Um, why don't you start by just giving a, a very brief overview of, of the main arguments in the book? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> so my sense of this book, uh, Settlers, as you said, uh, is that Jay Sakai is making an argument about uh, the nature of US history, the nature of class struggle, and the nature in particular of the white working class. Uh, and he is making the argument that uh, while there are certainly white workers in the US, uh, there is not a white proletariat, that white workers in the US are not proletarians. And he, I think, means a couple of things by that. One, um, <clears throat> couple of related things that white workers um, are not exploited and are not the basis of wealth accumulation in the US uh, so that instead of white workers being folks who built this society through their exploited labor in fact the white working class are parasites on uh, the, the real folks, the labor of the folks who actually built the society, which he understands as being colonial labor. So the real working class on which this society rests is um, workers of African descent uh, and other immigrant third world peoples, uh, Chicano, Mexicano people, uh, Asian migrants, and that those folks are the folks whose labor has been exploited and super exploited to build this society. Um, and yeah, that white workers sort of, whatever their particular individual life conditions as a class uh, are sort of on this, are a labor aristocracy is the terminology he uses coming from the works of Marx and Lenin, uh, sort of resting on top of that, that base of colonial labor, of the labor of what we would say people of color. Uh, he also means white workers are not a proletariat in that as a class, white workers don't have revolutionary potential. Um, and that the white working class, white workers do not by some sort of have a general collective uh, class interest in or aspiration toward socialist revolution and a communist society. Uh, instead, the political interest of white workers is with the maintenance of empire uh, in in more or less reactionary ways, right? So that could look like uh, sort of Swedish style social democracy, or that could look like Trumpist style alt-right fascism. But either way, uh, the white working class's interest and the path for that class as a class, as a collective body, is not a revolutionary one. And so um, I, I guess I just want to, like, we'll, we'll come back to this probably in a little bit, but um, when I first happened upon Sakai in 2003, I think I read that uh, famous interview when Race Burns class uh, mm -hmm. first, um, I felt, you know, I felt like it was just like shots fired at all of the, you know, sort of defensive white left that, um, you know, never wanted to talk about the primacy of race in U.S. history, never wanted to talk about anything other than, you know, essential class reductionism. Um, it seemed like a, uh, a very controversial thing, even then. So um, I can't imagine what it was like in 1983 when it first came out. So um, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and I think he's making also a, an argument that uh, the U.S. is a particular kind of society, right? That it's a settler colonial society, which makes it different from other forms of capitalist society, right? It makes it different than certainly any of, and the language he uses, which I'm going to go ahead and use, and we can get into it later, is third world, right? That's the framework that he uses to describe the divisions in the world. But also the U.S. society is different than European societies, right? In that um, folks came here from Europe with access to 
basically free land and that uh, the dispossession and genocide against the indigenous people of North America made it possible for the white working class not to be stuck in a working class position that made sort of a kind of unprecedented class mobility possible uh, for white folks who used to be proletarians. Um, and that, that that's unique. Um, and that there's a couple of different societies right that like that, right? Um, US is a settler colonial society, Canada, Australia, uh, South, South Africa, Africa or Zania. Uh, I think he mentioned it, Israel at some point. Certainly Israel is a settler colonial society, right? Uh, and that there's there's something about those kinds of societies, about that history, about that mm. building of a national identity uh, based on the theft of land uh, that both creates material privileges for people, but also I think maybe as important for us today, creates a set of a psychological outlook. Right? Uh, what was your experience when you first read it? Did you, like, how did you happen upon uh, this book? And, you know, uh, what was your reaction upon reading it? Uh, I happened upon this book. I think I was introduced to it by folks actually who were sort of veterans of the 70s and 80s anti-imperialist and uh, new communist movements on it. There were sort of debates swirling at the time in the movement circles and in the organization I was part of about what, how, to what extent was this useful as a framework. Um, and uh, it was... It was an important read. I guess I don't know to what extent I was blown away by it. Like it was. I don't know that it was at like this moment where I was blown away by it, and it was this life-changing spiritual experience. I think it's actually a book that's sort of grown on me over time, huh. uh, and I've sort of thought more and more about. Um, but I do think it's an uncomfortable book to read as a white person. Um, and I think that's that's one of the things that I think is really important and powerful about it uh, is Jay Sakai is making a commitment to tell the truth about U.S. history and about class struggle in the society, uh, regardless of whether it feels good or not. Uh, and I think, and I think as, that, that goes but, along along with um, maybe some some ongoing patterns that I've seen in academia. And, and I know that Jay Sky did this consciously. He said, you know, hey, maybe we should need to stop studying uh, people of color or mm -hmm. what's wrong with black people. And maybe we need to study white people. Maybe we need to turn mm -hmm. the lens around and start there. So sorry to interrupt you, but Precisely. that was his conscious choice, I think. Mm -hmm. And this maybe moves a little bit into the question of sort of the historical context and this intervention Sakai was making, if that's an okay perfect direction to move. Um, but yeah, he's he's very clear in sort of the couple of page preface to the book. Uh, he describes it uh, as um, a foray into enemy territory. Uh, now this is reconnaissance into enemy territory. Uh, in what by which he just means white society um, and he's very clearly um, from that preface writing this as he's writing this for um, the national liberation struggles of oppressed people he's writing this for folks of color he's not writing this uh, particularly to be a tool for the white left uh, although certainly it's a it's a tool and a gift for us, right? But it, I think it's worth keeping in mind that in reading this, we're basically lawyers, right? We're eavesdropping on a con on what initially was an internal conversation of uh, the liberation struggles of third world folks or people of color. So that's really important for people to, to know and to, to really understand that um, the language he was using, uh, some of the, the main things that he was addressing, um, some of those I think still exist. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them maybe show up in different ways now in, in different coded words. I think one of the things that brings up for me is that if folks are thinking about reading this book, uh, people need to be prepared for a high level of sort of uh, 70s Marxist-Leninese jargon. Uh, right? There's a lot of that. Uh, and at the same time, it's definitely not a dull or academic book in any way, right? These are... Right. Throughout the whole thing, these are fighting words. 
um, and he's, it's very lively. I think this book is useful, but the more I think of it, the more I think of it as a concrete political intervention in a particular moment, right? And I think this makes sense, particularly in the context of, um, you know, coming out of the 1960s, right, where folks became radicalized and were engaged in um, sort of mass direct action in the civil rights movement, on uh, urban rebellions and the Black Power movement and building the Black Panther Party, right, in fighting um, for land and sovereignty and the Chicano, Mexicano movements, uh, and also the student movements uh, and uh, anti-war movements in the oppressor nation among white folks. Uh, folks were becoming radicalized and sort of as those movements wound down, people started to understand themselves as revolutionaries, right? And started to understand that it was not just about undoing injustices, but it was about overthrowing US capitalism, imperialism, and putting in its place an entirely different kind of system. Folks trying to figure out how to move forward, how to develop a strategy for revolution, and turning toward what I think was uh, the most dogmatic and orthodox um, versions of Marxism-Leninism sort of borrowed from and sort of copied wholesale from uh, the Stalinist experience in the Soviet Union and uh, the Chinese Revolution. Uh, and in particular, the autonomous movements of oppressed peoples of color uh, were coming to a Marxist-Leninist politics that told them their problem strategically was that they had been prioritizing the liberation struggles of their own communities and what they needed to be doing was building a multiracial uh, vanguard party, right? And they just, you needed to unite the proletariat and that would do it, right? Instead of uh, a sort of sectional ethnic struggles, right? This sort of imposition of a 1930s communist universalism uh, as a strategy. And I think that's the context in which the Kairite settlers uh, is for the liberation struggles of folks of color. Folks are turning toward Marxism and getting the answer of, you need to unite with white people. That's the problem, right? It's about, and he says no. Uh, and I think what he does in some ways in this book is clarifies and coheres sort of the common sense of the liberation struggles of the 60s and 70s. Um, and in contrast to this dogmatic um, sort of black and white unite to fight, hand-me-down orthodox Stalinism says, no, we're going to develop a Mar Marxist understanding of this society that we live in. Uh, and that actually the orientation toward self-determination, the orientation toward national liberation, the orientation toward uh, destroying and attacking the white oppressor nation was in fact correct and is what a revolutionary communist politics on this continent looks like. So then why is this book so controversial and still uh, a place of just like total hysteria from white people? <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, I think there's a political answer to that and a more sort of psychological, personal, or spiritual one, right? And I think uh, to the extent that people come into politics and come into revolutionary politics to tell, to try to tell a story about themselves where they're the hero who saves the world, uh, which I think a lot of us do, right? Uh, particularly in our teens and 20s. Uh, Jay Sakai tells those of us who are white, you are not the hero of this story, right? Uh, that white folks collectively uh, are, are the bad guys of the story of, North, of class struggle in North America. Uh, and that's, whether or not one agrees with that entirely, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable thing to hear. Right. So exactly. So the the very common, um, you know, some of some of these critiques are well thought out. Some are just you know mudslinging. 
but if you really boil them down, um, there's a couple different ways you can challenge what Jay Sakai is saying in the book. One way is you can say, well, you're wrong. Um, very clearly you're wrong. White people are proletarians because they have this relationship to the boss, et cetera, et cetera. And it's no, no, nothing more than that. I think there's a more sophisticated version of that argument that comes out something to the effect of, well, if you really take Sakai's conclusions seriously, it means that we can't win. And it, I, I think they can explain it in a lot of different ways, but they're saying it's not true because then it means we can't win. That's why it's not true. And that seems like a very faulty logic to me. <laughs> well, it's it speaks to me to the ways of how addicted the left is to lying to itself and lying to everybody else and deep dishonesty. Lying about what? Left political culture. Um, that something is true or not depending on whether it makes us hopeful, right? Like our first responsibility as pro-revolutionary people is to tell the truth. Um, and I think that's why I don't agree with everything Sakai says. I don't agree with all his arguments, but he's committed to telling uncomfortable truths. Um, and this idea of, well, if this is true, we can't win, that doesn't determine whether or not it's true, right? It's possible we can't win. There's also a level of hubris involved and deep colonial arrogance yeah. of we, we can only win if white people are waving the red flag on the battlefield too, right? It's possible that the forces of revolution can win and that means a collective defeat for white people. Um, that's not actually necessarily my position, but it's certainly what what looked like Sakai's position in the 80s. Right. And I, I don't, that's not my takeaway either these days, <laughs> but I think that you're right, that he was actually putting that on the table at the time. I mean, <laughs> conditions are a lot different now. Let's just yes. be really clear. Let's, if we haven't said that yet, but it's very different. Settlers is a book about the creation of a privileged uh, aristocracy of labor, right? Uh, a white working class with access to all the goodies and the good life on some level, right? Through its parasitic relationship mm -hmm. to black and brown workers. Um, Sakai has also talked about how that is being undone by neoliberalism and neocolonialism uh, and how not as a result of revolutionary class struggle, but as a result of the transformations of capitalism and neocolonialism, um, that those privileges are being stripped away from white workers. Um, and that as that process happens from above, uh, what we are seeing is not necessarily a move uh, toward uh, sort of class unity uh, or proletarian internationalism on the part of white workers, but instead a desperate and vicious attempt to defend uh, what was, to defend those privileges, to defend that way of life and to make America great again, right? And I think that the attempt of the white sort of labor aristocracy and middle class to hold on to the privileges that global capitalism is tearing away from it uh, is the basis for the kind of fascist revival we're seeing today. Um, context. I think it, there's another way in which it matters that he writes this as a foreign to enemy territory, right? That he writes this as a document. And I think he says in the preface for the newest edition uh, from our fabulous comrades at Chris Blubbadub, uh, who consistently published great work, uh, that this was initially written as plans to only photocopy 50 copies of my typed draft for internal education in the underground <laughs> Black Liberation Army Coordinating Committee. Comrades with more sense than myself insisted that we publish it as a book, if only for the liberation movement. Um, so he's writing this, right, for folks of color and specifically for the most militant wing of the Black Liberation Movement. Um, and I think... Um, that's worth keeping in mind in terms of the arguments, right? Uh, suggesting to 
revolutionaries of color not to depend on white people to save you. Uh, right? I don't. I can't think of any people of color liberation struggle that has suffered from having uh, not enough faith in white people. Right? Uh, that that strikes me as just like basic. Uh, framework of strategic and tactical self-defense is you don't depend on white people to save your shit. Yeah. Right? I do think these whether these arguments apply in a different way for us as white folks who are pro-revolutionaries. Uh, and I think on some level, the question of is the white working class revolutionary, right, which is the question that this book is struggling around. Uh, the answer is we don't fucking know. Right? We don't know outside of a revolutionary situation. If there's going to be a revolution, all kinds of things that we never would have expected and never could have predicted are going to happen. And the winning over of masses of white workers may well be one of those things. And it's our job to make that what happens, right? Uh, so while we should learn from uh, this book, and the arguments it makes about U.S. history, uh, I think it's also our responsibility to look for um, the cracks in whiteness, right? And try to break those things open to bring over as many people as possible to the right side of history. Uh, that's our responsibility. That's not the responsibility of Jay Sakai or the audience he had in mind when he wrote this in the 80s. So what, I mean, and you've been speaking to it, but what is, uh, what should we be uh, taking away from settlers and, uh, you know, basically some of the, you know, Facebook arguments and some of the arguments going on in the left right now about settlers was that don't read it, it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And um, why would one read settlers? What would you want someone to, to see by reading this book? Yeah, uh, I think people should read settlers in some ways as a uh, an antidote to mainstream left labor history, right? Which tells this sort of rosy story of the ways in which the workers get together and unite and fight the boss and win a better world, right? Um, and Sakai makes clear that largely that's a lie. That's not how history happened. Um, and I think, I think people need to read this book because we need to tell ourselves the truth about the world we live in. And that truth is that uh, worker struggles in the US and the labor movement on this continent have consistently been uh, undermined, destroyed, poisoned and corrupted uh, by, by privilege and by white supremacy and by colonialism. Um, I don't think Sakai is the only person who tells that story. Mm -hmm. you know, I don't think this is the only book people should read about this. Um, but I think it makes an important set of arguments and I think it's also part of um, a political and ideological tendency uh, that has a lot to teach us. What you were speaking about, uh, the ascendant sort of uh, neo-fascist alt-right movement that we see, um, it, to me, uh, the conviction that uh, that Jay Sakai has about the nature of, of whiteness and how it relates to a uh, class character in the United States mm -hmm. seems pretty clear because um, when push comes to shove, what uh, what alliances do you do you go to? And I think we are seeing that a certain segment of uh, you know I wouldn't call them rich people of white people in the United States are choosing race over class, and that the nature of tr the base of Trumpism is precisely the result of settler colonial society, right? Uh, the sort of rugged frontiersman mentality, right? The machismo, the orientation toward violence, the entitlement, um, all of that is not just a result of privilege abstractly, but is the result of the history of this country, right? The history of it being a settler colonial society where people came here, engaged in genocide and got land out of that, right? And that history is still very much alive in the, particularly the culture and the consciousness, I think, of Trump's base. 
what else do you see as you know being different now uh, than maybe even 15 years ago since we've been around or or longer sure uh, I think society is clearly in a state of crisis and collapse in a way that was not as clear or obvious in as you said 2003 was also when I first read this book right uh, so I think uh, you know and we were engaged in social movements and we were engaged in militant activity you know of various sorts during that period right uh, you know, we met through the anti-globalization and anti-war movements right and like there were real struggles we were involved in we were organizing and uh, those those social movements that we were attempting to build were marginal uh, in a way that movements liberation struggles now or not uh, I feel like particularly uh, Standing Rock uh, and the struggles of indigenous folks against colonialism and extractive industries and then obviously uh, the Black Lives Matter movement in opposition to racist state violence uh, have stepped into um, the middle of the society in the middle of history and are you know making making demands and attacking the power structure in a way that uh, I don't know if we really would have dreamed that the movements we're a part of would be doing anything like that. Uh, but so the movements are much more, much more powerful, much more dynamic, much more mass based. Uh, the society as a whole, the system is much more clearly in crisis. Uh, and I think the far right is on the move right now in a way that it certainly was not then. And I think actually, um, my sense is actually the far insurgent right wing, um, the alt-right, the fascists are much more in a position to be determining uh, what is the agenda of society than actually anybody else right now. Um, certainly more so than the left, which is engaging in um, I think really inspiring and heroic struggles and resistance and I think there are ways in which we're a little bit behind in terms of uh, organizational infrastructure, um, strategy, figuring some of that stuff out, right? Because the far right has been, you know, since, since Sakai wrote this fucking book, uh, has been in a continuous way building a movement and developing a strategy to win power. Uh, and the, the left and the liberation struggles for a number of reasons have not been. Uh, and whether or not we can catch up, whether or not we just try to fight them back to engage in harm reduction, uh, I don't know. Uh, so I'm, I don't know, it's hard, right? Good questions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Things, um, things are much more interesting now than they were then. Uh, I would I would say so in, in a very scary way. I mean, it felt like like it felt like actually in, in my naive you know 21 year old mind that um that certain types of victory were just around the corner um but it didn't feel high stakes and now it feels pretty high stakes and i, I don't know what's around the corner honestly it, it seems like uh there's a lot of questions that will determine a lot of things coming up soon mm -hmm. one other thing i think is the intellectual state of the left uh, this book was I remember being very obscure uh, and was not, you know, a book that people were reading everywhere. Uh, and now I feel like that's changed. And I feel, you know, uh, I spend a lot of time feeling, looking at left discussion and feeling like an old person these days. Uh, but I think a lot of the stuff that we were, uh, sort of searching out and finding and grappling with uh, in very small circles uh, in in the early 2000s, a lot more people are engaging those ideas and those kinds of revolutionary politics right now, uh, which is really exciting. Right, I mean... And, and so, like, I guess one way that we can maybe shine some light on some of this is that, um, like, in the last decade, I think pretty safely to say, uh, there's been this sort of rise and then 
beginning in some ways to fall uh, sort of you know call out culture and um, this whole you know ecosystem of how to call out people out and you know this is what you have to do to be involved in social justice and and that's been the focus of a lot of people that I that I seem to have um, decent grasp on race and, and stuff in the United States and so in one way race is talked about maybe more by white people but it doesn't for me seem to be mostly useful or actually informing work or organizing or real lives of anyone other than just sort of uh so that's the one way in, in which it, it seems like we've made progress maybe in the left in a lot of ways but then sometimes i, I question that because um as you said the it's not easy to look at some of these these like truths that jessica argues uh the white person and it's not fun to just acknowledge maybe i'm in, i'm in the back seat strategically here and mm. i need to be aligning myself with the struggles of people of color in order to to get revolutionary uh progress here there's a lot of work you know of that being politically active on being committed to revolutionary politics i think requires a lot of humility period from anyone right uh, and requires a level of putting one's ego in the back seat right uh, and i think jason kai supports those of us who are white in doing that uh in a way that's i think particularly brutal uh but effective uh, well i can only imagine so, that if i didn't have uh some really good hand holding in 2003 when i was engaging some of these ideas you know and and if i hadn't been involved in uh some campaigns led by people of color and and seen you know really been shown how to be a part of those campaigns in a useful way i wouldn't have been able to even begin to process some of these things so i want to just say you know and you, you said this too but i i do want to say that it's okay to feel defensive and uncomfortable and maybe even angry about some of these things it's it's not a pleasant truth um but uh all we can do is try to look at the facts and the truth and then go from there and and you've been saying that much better than i have so yeah significant numbers of white worker workers and middle class folks losing their privilege are going to break right right and are going to fight viciously to defend their privilege but that's not the only thing that's happening right we are seeing um the growth of militant left-wing politics and that's something to celebrate and that does include you know white folks and white working class folks uh so i think i think people should read this book but i also think uh people shouldn't read this book as a reason not to commit to uh transforming history right um uh, because there are all kinds of possibilities and if revolution is one of them then a lot of unpredictable and surprising things are going to happen and it's our job to make some of those things happen